If you have your Bible, you can open it and turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. That uh, song the choir shared with us goes right in hand with the truth of, of God's Word. It's a miracle that we are able to bless the Lord. To, and the reason we're able to do that is because He has miraculous, re, miraculously revealed Himself to us. That we're able to worship Him is yet another miracle, one that He makes possible. And the reason these things are possible is because the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit of God, has made known who God is and has revealed Himself to us in a way that we can understand. And when you think about that for a moment, that the almighty, eternal God of heaven and earth who created all things has created a way for us to know who he is and understand, that's a lot to be thankful for. Our text today speaks of the baptism and the death of Christ and the witness that that has been born over the generations to the truth of those events and their significance. Christ was baptized. He ministered to many, and although he was crucified and has risen from the dead and ascended on high, his ministry continues to today and beyond. Now, you may have never really thought about the significance of Christ's baptism, but it is very significant. It's a very important event in the life of Christ. In our case, baptism is symbolic, and it's an important symbolism that is expressed in the ordinance of baptism because it symbolizes the new life in Christ. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. And it brings to mind many things, of course, Christ's death and resurrection and the future resurrection of those who believe on him, but primarily it identifies us with our faith and the experience that we all have when we come to faith in Christ, and that is the experience we gain of having power over sin. But the reason we have power over sin when we come to Christ is because the spirit of truth comes to reside inside of us. Now, Christ's baptism, his life, his ministry, his death, as well as his resurrection are testified to as heavenly truth by both God and man. <clears throat> truth, or the battle for truth, is one that every person on earth is engaged in even if they are not an active participant. Even if they do not understand to what degree they are engaged in, that, in this battle, it is a reality. In other words, all of us are being exposed to both truth and deception and must discover which is which with regard to what we will believe. Now that's the bad news because it's hard to know what to believe sometimes. But the good news is that God has given us his spirit to provide all the help that we need. Look with me at our text, 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for your word and the wisdom it contains. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be gathered in your presence as the people of God, and as always, Lord, I thank you for the privilege I have to share your word with your people. We pray, Father, that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word and the remainder of this service. 
Lord, that you would help each one of us glean the truth that we need from this passage of Scripture to grow closer to you, to better understand who you are and what you've done in our lives and what you seek to do in and through us in the world around us. We thank you, Father, for the witness that your word provides us in the testimony. We thank you for the spirit of truth who makes known these things so that we might put our faith in you. We ask, Father, that you would guide us with your word, Lord, that you would impress upon us the decisions that we should make by its truth. Help us, Lord, to be open with you in our daily devotion to prayer. And Lord, let us never miss an opportunity to bring glory to you by sharing the gospel with the world around us. We thank you for these things. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, verse 6 declares emphatically that Jesus is the Son of God. And it points out to us at least two ways in which Christ has been made known as the Son of God. He is he that came by water and by blood. And that is a direct reference to Christ's baptism and Christ's death. We need to understand that Christ's baptism declares him as the Son of God. It declares his sonship as well as his death. His death declares his sonship. Now, baptism, in the case of Christ, is a great witness. And in our case as well, it declares to the world around when we are baptized that we are identifying as a follower of Christ and that we are putting our faith in the gospel of Jesus. Do you know there's some countries in the world today where you can convert to Christianity all you like as long as you don't get baptized? And so there are, there are some brothers and sisters in Christ in the world today who are baptized in secret because they know to do so openly would invite persecution even unto death. And so in those countries, I feel like perhaps uh, even the pagans sometimes understand the significance of baptism better than some of us do because it identifies us as belonging to God. Now, it did the same thing for Christ, but in a much more powerful and miraculous way. We know that his baptism launched his earthly ministry. I think sometimes we forget, though, it, the miraculous things that occurred. Because sometimes, I th as Christians, uh, I think we get desensitized to the miraculous events of the Bible. But anytime a miracle is described in the Word of God, I want to encourage you to take time and reflect upon it. Because God does not move in a miraculous way without significance. And in the case of Christ and his baptism, the first miracle we saw are, are, are in Scripture is that the Spirit of God descended as a dove. Now, this was significant because John knew what, that his mission was to declare to those who would listen, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So let's look at John chapter 1. And read what John had to say about the baptism of Jesus. So John chapter 1 and verse 32. And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John the Baptist was promised a miracle, a very specific miracle. It was prophesied to him that he would see the Spirit of God descend as a dove and rest upon someone, and that someone would be him who baptized in the Holy Ghost. 
something that John only aspired to. Because if you recall, when Jesus came to be baptized, he said, me baptize you? You should baptize me. And he saw that it was the Son of God, the Spirit of God descended. And that, that is very significant and unique among all the baptisms and all the history of the world. Because it declared that this was the Son of God. Now the second miracle was the voice of God. And it is testified to us in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at Luke chapter 3 Luke chapter 3 and verse 22 and it says there and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said thou art my beloved son in thee I am well pleased Those were miraculous words uttered in a miraculous way during a miraculous event. And when we take time to think about it, we realize that that's something that we all look forward to. Because as Christians, what's the goal? To experience a miraculous event in the presence of Almighty God and hear him say, well done good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen? And so you see, Christ's uh, baptism not only gives us something to look back to, but something to look forward to. And we know that our Heavenly Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that this experience of hearing God say something miraculous in a miraculous way during a miraculous event is something that every believer in Christ who has died and gone on to glory has had. And one that every believer who is remaining here will have, either at the moment of death or at the point in which Christ returns and, and takes the church into glory. So Christ's baptism has many things going on, both in the present and in the future, and it's instructive in, in many ways. But most of all, it, it's powerful, powerful testimony to who Christ is and gives us a little better ability to understand more about him. So that's his baptism. Now let's... let's Let's think about Christ on the cross, how that declares his sonship. And get ready for a sword drill, because we're going to take a trip uh, through the New Testament. You can start with Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verses, well, just verse 28, I think. Matthew 26, verse 28. Here Christ is instituting the Lord's Supper. And in verse 27, it says, He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to him, and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Christ on the cross declares his sonship in that through him, our sins are forgiven. By his sacrifice on the cross, our sins are forgiven. Only the Son of God could accomplish that feat. Recall the, the, the lame man to whom Christ said, your sins are forgiven. And those around him said, wait a minute, only God can forgive sins. Who does this man think he is? And Christ, knowing their thoughts, what did he say? He said, so that you might know what I say is true, he told the man, take your bed, rise up, and walk. 
So even, even those who did not believe in Christ knew that only God could forgive sins. And on the cross, our sins were forgiven. Now look at Galatians chapter 3. In order for our sins to be forgiven, something miraculous had to occur. Our sins had to be born or taken on by Christ. And that is a, a divine event that, that could only occur through the power of God for the sins of the whole world to be laid on Christ on the cross. Look at chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 13. And it says there, Christ, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so the, the curse of our sin was laid on Christ on the cross. And that could only be accomplished by the power of God. And only God could bear that burden of sin. No one else. So you see, the cross declares the sonship of Christ. Look with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we find that the judgment, the wrath of God that was meant for us was taken by Christ. He took our judgment. He took our punishment. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. And just, a, just as a side note, that man, what an indictment there that, that Peter is, is, is placing before his readers that you were not redeemed with anything corruptible or temporary, implying rather that we were redeemed by the incorruptible and the eternal. By definition, divine. So that, that statement in and of itself tells us that, yes, Christ was the Son of God, but he goes on, not by tradition from your fathers. And that's a very important statement because people still fall into the trap of putting their faith in tradition rather than in the God who died to save them. And why do I say that? Because when you, when you look around in the world, you will find a lot of people who claim to be Christian and nothing about their life is Christ-like. Peter wrote to his audience knowing that there were people who claimed to be followers of God, yet in their life there was nothing that indicated they were. You know, one, of the thing, one of the terms that, have, that has risen in popularity in, in politics these days is, is a rhino, a Republican in name only. Well, that's that's probably true. There are probably some, some politicians who are, you know, only in name only what they claim to be. But Peter's making it very clear that even in matters of faith, there are people who are in name only what they claim to be. In substance, they really aren't who they present themselves as. Also known as a hypocrite, a counterfeit of the real thing. And the, the trap of believing in tradition produces exactly that. And it can produce nothing else. But believing in Jesus Christ, putting our trust and our faith in Him, that allows the Holy Spirit to indwell us and change us and empower us to believe and understand and know God and get to know him more and live according to his word as we should. So forgive me for that side note. Let's go back to verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was ma made or excuse me was manifest in these last times for you so you see Christ offered himself up as a sacrificial lamb and this is this is a reference to the mosaic law the old covenant how they would take the lamb or the sacrifice and the priest would lay his hand on the head of the animal and they would slay the animal and then they would sacrifice the animal as a temporary atonement for sin you see the best that man could do even under the instruction guidance and direction of God through his servant Moses and the covenant that was established at that time was only temporary day in day out week after week month after month year after year these sacrifices were ongoing but when Christ offered himself as a sacrificial lamb incorruptible and eternal it was once for all when he said on the cross it is finished it was never another need for a sacrifice ever again in fact to th that the fact that sacrifices continued after the crucifixion of Christ was really an affront to what God had done and had finished on the cross and when sacrifices resume as scripture indicates they one day will it will still be an affront to God because it is finished we have been redeemed by an incorruptible and eternal sacrificial lamb and that is Jesus Christ only God could accomplish these things and beloved we've just scratched the surface in the short time that we've spent on the baptism of Christ and Christ on the cross I encourage you to delve deeply into God's Word and understand more the significance of his baptism and his crucifixion because only God could accomplish these things and there are other things that the spirit of truth bears witness regarding and the spirit is truth and bearing witness even to this day look with me back at John chapter 16 go to John chapter 16 look at verse 12 sometimes we forget that the ministry of Christ continues unto this day and beyond and there are things that Christ would have said himself but he could not say and how do we know that because there was a time in which Christ knew that the words he couldn't that he wanted to say could not be born in verse 12 it says I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now. So the work on, uh, that Christ accomplished on the cross finished forever the need for sacrifice. But there was another need. And just as Christ's baptism was a beginning of his ministry in a way his his death and resurrection was a new beginning as well because with it the ministry expanded exponentially it says in verse they verse 13 how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth now, does that mean that we are in possession of all truth at this very moment? Well, I hope none of us think so. Because if we were in possession of all truth, we'd have no need to, to assemble ourselves together and delve into the truth. But 
Jesus said, the Spirit has come, the Spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all truth. And, other, and I believe that is a look to the future. Because there will be a moment, not in time, but in eternity, where we will be in possession of all truth. And the Spirit is guiding us towards that destination. So we're growing in truth, being guided into all truth, but guess what? We're not there yet. It says that he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And those things, beloved, that do not speak of the, the Spirit himself, those things that he heard and those things that he spoke and those things that show us what is to come have been recorded for us in the word of God. And so what Christ promised would occur has occurred. The Spirit has come in all truth and his words guide us into truth and show us those things that are and those things which are yet to be. So we've got our, our work cut out for us when it comes to uh, absorbing this truth because it's more than we could ever absorb in a lifetime. But that's good to know because it, it tells me that we can never plumb the depths of truth that God has revealed to those who love and follow him. Which means as we pursue meaning in this life, it is a pursuit that we can always apply ourselves to. And I believe that the Bible indicates that the pursuit of God does not end when this life ends. It, rather, it multiplies. And so we have that to look forward to as well. So the Spirit, in, in this truth that he, the, he brought and in these things that He has revealed, has, has done so much that that we could never even get close to the miracles that have occurred by the ministry of the Spirit in the time that we have left this morning. So I want to go over, there, over them briefly and encourage you to search, search scriptures to find these affirmations uh, on your own time. But the Spirit, fulfilling the words of Christ, one of the things He does is convicts of sin. And guess what? The Spirit has to do that. Because we're all born into sin. It's our natural state. It's the status quo. And, and it's human nature to remain in our natural state and not disrupt the status quo. But the Holy Spirit, one of the things that he does, he miraculously reveals the sin nature that we are all held captive by, convicts us of that sin so that we might pursue an escape through faith in Christ, and so he convicts of sin. The, uh, following that conviction, as someone journeys out of deception into truth, he gives us the avenue of approach to God so that we might have eternal life. So he convicts of sin. He reveals the, 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 the death that sin produces spiritually in everyone here on this earth and the wrath to come in, in, in the next life. But uh, on the other hand, he shows how we can escape that and how we can have eternal life. And once we have eternal life, you, uh, anyone who's ever been a new believer understands how important it is that we have an assurance that we have not bought into some sort of fraud or false faith. And so the Holy Spirit gives us assurance through his testimony and through the testimony of the word and the testimony of believers. He gives us wisdom because he teaches us through his word and as we grow in Christ and we mature in our faith we begin to learn that the truth that God has revealed and preserved is something that is spiritual sustenance for each one of us and we have to feed on that word in order to be strong in our faith and grow and we're, he's able to teach us because he has indwelled Every believer, in a spiritual sense, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. As we sang earlier about being the temple of God, he's, He is with us. And He's there to empower us to do the things that 
Christ has called us to do, to bear the burden and carry the yoke that Christ has promised will be light and easy. And the reason it is light and easy is because the Holy Spirit empowers us. Not only that, when he has empowered us to take on the burden or, or res respond to the call to ministry that he places on everyone, he guides us. We don't have to worry about going wrong when we're relying on the Holy Spirit to show us what to do. And he has shown us exactly what to do because he's given us the word of God. And then when we are applying the word of God to our life, being empowered by the Holy Spirit and guide, guided by him in the ways in which we can bring glory to God, then he ministers to us and through us. Look with me uh, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, look at verse 16. It says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give unto you. Now that is a verse that is very often taken out of context. Remember, very often Christians ask and receive not because Scripture says they ask amiss. But if you ask God to empower you and guide you and minister in and through you that you might go and bring forth fruit that is spiritual works that are eternal in nature and have a spiritual impact on others that are eternal as well, then he will give it to you. Maybe not in the way that you expect, because sometimes accomplishing those things, we have to go through much adversity, and we have to face spiritual opposition, even persecution, and we have to go to battle in the spiritual realm for God to accomplish these things in us and through us. So it's not all rainbow and cupcakes when God answers prayer. Sometimes it's a battle. In fact, I would say in, in almost every circumstance where we are doing what God has called us to do, a battle is raging, whether we are aware of it or not. So in conclusion, I want to go over the last two verses in our, in our text, and I, I do say in conclusion because we're going to wrap this up fairly quickly. 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You need nothing more in Scripture to explain to you the, the, the triune nature of God. Here we have the Trinity uh, explained to us as, as in, in a way that impacts our life because uh, there's a, uh, there is a testimony to be had by the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then it says in verse 8, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And so in conclusion, the Word of God is revealing to us and telling us that with, with regard to the sonship of Christ, we have a heavenly testimony from the witness of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then we also have an earthly testimony as the Spirit and the water and the blood testimony uh, or testify to the Sonship of Christ. And so truth is presented to us in a miraculous way in heaven and on earth.